Hello, welcome back to our garden here in Lincolnshire for the fourth and final episode of Plant Life's No Mo May video diary. We're halfway through June, uh, it's the 15th of June today, and uh, the weather since the last episode has combined a cool period with now a very warm period. It's been dry throughout, but nevertheless, the growth in our lawn here has been significant. So I'm going to give some thought to how I can create and maintain through the rest of summer different zones for wildlife, but for us to enjoy too. I'm going to mow a thoroughfare, which will provide access to our play equipment, while at the same time, trying my best to retain as much as I can of what is now rapidly becoming a wildflower meadow. This will give me the opportunity to illustrate how I'm going to approach mowing taller grass carefully so that I minimize any harm I could cause to any wildlife. Um, you've seen me in the first episode use an Austrian scythe and a manual push mower. This time I'm going to use a very lightweight strimmer, which many people have in their shed. But first, let's have a look at what's been growing since you last paid us a visit and what wildflowers have been opening up in the meantime. Both white and red clover have opened up now and they're providing a banquet for a whole host of wild species of bees. Being members of the pea family, the shape of their flowers suits a longer proboscis or tongue length for pollinators. And these are the kind of wildflowers that can suffer being mown every four to six weeks through the growing season because naturally they've evolved to cope with grazing. That means that if you need to maintain a shorter, neater, but still colorful and wildflower rich part of your lawn, you can maintain it as a flowering lawn featuring plants like clover, which will continue to provide for pollinators. Common bird's foot trefoil is a real asset in your lawn. Its leaves are an important source of food for the caterpillars of a wide range of moths and butterflies. And its flowers are an important source of pollen and nectar as well. Other members of the pea family include the lower growing lesser trefoil and the delicate smooth tear. Many people's favorite, Oxeye Daisy, is fully out now, advertising its flowers with a spread of white ray florets, inviting pollinators to land on its central golden disc of florets, which will provide pollen and nectar for shorter tongued pollinators. Although it might not be the prettiest wildflower in the lawn, ribwort plantain is now in flower. Its leaves are providing important food for our invertebrates. One of the nicest surprises of my Nomo May has been to discover meadow crane spill, a wild member of the geranium family, growing out from under our trampoline. A closer look at grasses reveals just how different they are. Recognisable as a kind of barley, wall barley can tolerate quite dry conditions. Some grasses have really evocative and descriptive names, such as the soft, downy Yorkshire fog, and the cat's tails, such as Timothy, and smaller cat's tail. Meadow foxtail is also very descriptive of how those flower spikes appear. Then there are some grasses which have very bristle-like leaves, like red fescue. Barren brome has characteristically drooping, widely spaced spikelets that dance in the slightest breeze. It's a very short-lived grass. It's an annual, or at most, a biennial, so it relies on producing and setting seed 
to propagate itself into the next season. So if we want to reduce the amount of this grass and give an opportunity to the wildflowers to colonize the space that they leave, well, we can cut this earlier in the year. Before I start to use the strimmer, it's a really good idea to make a careful fingertip search of the area I'm going to mow first, just to check for any vulnerable wildlife. I want to move through the area I'm going to mow and pull aside the grass and carefully look to see whether I'm disturbing anything like lizards, amphibians, such as frogs or toads, or even newts, perhaps the nest of a mouse. Don't forget your pets. There might be a cat enjoying the long grass. So take your time and work your way through the sward and watch out for anything that might be seeking sanctuary down below in the undergrowth. Don't forget, hedgehogs don't have any fight or flight response to any threat, so they're worth looking for very carefully too. Also, it's really important to remember to work gradually on a front and move that front slowly and carefully towards shelter. Never work your way from the outside inwards as a spiral because that simply creates a horrible killing zone for that wildlife that can't escape. So move towards a boundary, like a hedgerow base, towards cover so that wildlife can gradually move away from the disturbance you're creating. When using any power tool, it's really important, of course, to put safety first. When you're using a strimmer, for example, then try to avoid patches of loose gravel because those pieces of gravel can be turned into little bullets that will fly in all directions at once. So try to think about pets and children. Keep them out of the garden completely when you're, you're going to do some work with a strimmer. Otherwise, a safe working distance tends to be at least 15 meters. That's not always possible in a small space. So you might want to take some time to protect the glass in a greenhouse or in the windows of your house before you start work. Is there a safer time to work? And if there is, pick that time and play it safe. And look after yourself too. That starts with making sure that your tool is in good working order to start with. Then of course, you know, make sure you've read the operating instructions, the safety guidelines, and you keep to them. Then of course, um, make sure you're protected with the right personal protective equipment or PPE. That starts with a stout pair of boots, trousers, long sleeves, some protection for your hands in the form of gloves with a good grip. Then look after your eyes with shatterproof specs. Um, you might want to protect your ears too with ear defenders, but if you're like me and you have very pale Irish skin, you might prefer to put on the sun hat and make use of an appropriate pair of earplugs instead. I'm using an electric strimmer, so whenever you use an electric power tool, always use a circuit breaker, just in case you cut through your power cable accidentally. So, wildlife and safety checks done. Strimmer, it's cable and connectors checked, PPE on, and we're ready to strip. To safeguard any wildlife you may encounter, work slowly and gradually with a high cut first of all, before repeating at a lower level. This will flush wildlife ahead of your progress, giving it a chance to escape and a chance for you to notice it, avoid it and give it some help to avoid you if needed. A really good approach to take which can balance garden and green space management for wildlife and for our enjoyment, is to divide areas into zones. It can be helpful to imagine different flavors of grassland within a space, each complementing the others and providing its own benefits. Where you need a functional surface along thoroughfares and for recreation, you will need to mow frequently to maintain a short, neat turf. 
Framing this where you might not want tall growth can be a flowering lawn mown every four to eight weeks, which can support the kinds of flowers such as clovers, trefoils, self heal and yarrow that have evolved to cope with wild grazing and will regrow and reflower after every mow, continuing to provide pollen and nectar through the growth season. Stepping outwards and upwards, we can also create meadow-like zones where we hold off from mowing between April and August inclusive. These areas can develop the greatest wildflower diversity and become the perennial herbaceous borders we never need to feed, weed, mulch or water. Because these parts are less frequently disturbed, they can support more life cycles for plants and invertebrates during key parts of the year, while also sheltering larger animals too. So when we mow here, we need to take extra care. But a lot of our wildlife needs rougher, more structural grassland that provides shelter over winter. So if you can, it is vital to keep perhaps even just the boundaries of your space, the fence lines and the bases of your hedgerows undisturbed, except perhaps for snipping out any establishing tree saplings or taking back some of the bramble at the end of the year if it just gets a little too much. Tall herbs such as cow parsley, hogweed, nettle and thistles are all incredibly important for our wildlife, as are dense grass tussocks which can all be allowed to persist in sanctuary strips. So we have a range of options and as a gardener or a green space manager, this is your canvas. You're the artist and you hold the paintbrush. Instead of feeling that you have to mow everywhere all at once, frequently throughout the whole year, hopefully you feel that by taking part in No Mow May, you've opened a door to new possibilities. And hopefully you've been at least a little bit inspired to reimagine the traditional neat green British lawn as a place where different worlds can coexist, each supporting us and our wildlife in different ways. Wildflower rich grassland is among the richest of our habitats for wildlife and it's the best for our struggling pollinators. Because we've lost over 97% of it since the 1930s, we really need to do all we can to rekindle it. Nearly 23 million private gardens and over 43,000 public green spaces can all add up to make a huge difference, throwing a much needed lifeline to nature's recovery. On behalf of Plant Life, thank you so much for taking part in this year's No Mow May. We hope you can continue to be kinder to nature for the rest of this year and carry on the good work in future years too. Bye bye.